Neil Wagner told anyone who would listen that he would make it as a professional cricketer no matter what. But to many who knew him, that seemed like a fairly big mountain to climb. It was clear that he had talent, and he was high energy and could bowl all day and was reasonably accurate. But he wasn't fast fast, nor was he a magician with the ball, and most crucially, he was very short for a fast bowler. Back then, I suppose he was some sort of weird mix of Andre Nell and Dale Steyn, but left-armed, and obviously less skilled. He had some of Nell's incredible work ethic and on-field anger, and he had pace, but he was probably halfway between Andre Nell and Dale Steyn in velocity. This is the last knot. My dad told me to save us. But there are a few more other things that they had in common. Wagner was in the same domestic setup as Steyn. And if your height challenged, the worst thing you can have is another bowler who is better than you at the same low release point. But there was also another bowler who was holding him back. This guy was about the same height as Dale Steyn and Neil Wagner put together. Mornay Morkel took a long time to develop, and maybe he never quite got to the Joel Garner level that he should have. But he was the 4 for 80 man. So this meant that Wagner was behind the two most obvious fast bowling talents around domestically and internationally. Because when Wagner played for Northerns, which is one of the teams that formed the Titans franchise, he took 79 wickets at 18. For those who don't know, that is a little bit like the second tier first class system of South Africa. The main league was of course where the Titans were playing. And he did play twice for them, but he only took three wickets at almost 40. And people thought he was good, but not quite good enough. And not only did the Titans have Dale Steyn and Mornay Morkel, because they had Mornay, they also had Elby Morkel. And that guy I mentioned before, Andre Nell, he also played for the Titans. When he was asked originally why Wagner didn't make it in South Africa, he would talk about the quota system. But later on, he would admit it was more about being at the wrong team at the wrong time. And he was also pigeonholed by people in South Africa as too small, and not quite fast enough, and maybe not quite as skillful as he should have been. Plus, South Africa has never really had that kind of thirst for left arm seam like someone like Pakistan has had. So that was the end of Wagner phase one. A lot of very good players just disappear at this point. But Wagner wasn't that kind of guy. He was desperate to make it as professional, and he was incredibly proactive about it. He wasn't going to let two great bowlers stop his progress, so he pivoted twice. In 2008, he played in the Liverpool League. He took 50 wickets at 15. He wasn't even the only test player who was doing quite well there. Simon Kerrigan took 69 wickets at 13. That was good enough for Wagner to get some second 11 cricket with Sussex. And at the end of the year, he was offered deals by them and Hampshire as a coal pack. Usually that's what a player in that situation would do. But he went very rogue and he decided to go and play for Otago in New Zealand on a lot less money. It was quite a bold and unusual choice, especially as Wagner's father is English. But Otago coach Mike Hessen, who would go on to be New Zealand's head, persuaded him to come over. And the real reason Wagner chose that is because he wanted to play international cricket. In his first game for Otago, it didn't go all his own way. Trent Bolt saw this short, snarling fast bowler with lots of histrionics and openly mocked him on the field. Wagner was what they call in South Africa a proper Dutchman, and he was trained to be very aggressive. But New Zealanders thought that was silly. So early on, Wagner realized that he had to fit in, and so he went from a pocket-sized Andre Nell to something a little bit more respectable in his new home. And that was the end of his second phase. The shorter bowling and aggressive nature of his younger self seemed to disappear a little bit from his armory as he became a Kiwi legs bowler. But he took a lot of wickets, and he was identified as a future New Zealand player almost immediately. And by his third season, he was the top wicket taker in Plunkett Shield. And he backed that up again the following year. New Zealand picked him to make his debut in 2012. In just over two years of 12 tests, he managed 39 wickets and an average of 38. Very mediocre. The problem was that Wagner wasn't that fast, he wasn't that tall, and he wasn't that skillful. He had energy and stamina and was fairly accurate. But at test cricket, everything that had held him back domestically in South Africa was still more or less in play. There were some bright spots like his five wicket haul in Bangladesh that said you certainly shouldn't move on from him. But with his record, it was hard to see what he was going to do next. And at this stage in his career, Wagner was a length bowler. He had actually bowled more full tosses than bounces. And in 20 innings, he'd only delivered seven genuine short balls. He just didn't look particularly threatening in test cricket at all. And let's be really brutal here. If he wasn't left arm and had been able to bowl very long dog spells at times, he probably would have been written off as a first class only cricketer. But then he played the test match that basically changed his life. At Auckland in 2014 against India, New Zealand pulled on over 500 in the first innings and Wagner catches him with four wickets to help mop up the tail in the first innings, giving New Zealand a massive lead. Unfortunately, they then collapse in the second innings, meaning that India needs 407 runs to win. And the first nine Indian players actually make it to double figures as they kind of crawl towards the target. But Wagner keeps chipping away, just taking enough wickets and making India feel less comfortable throughout the chase. And every wicket he gets is, of course, of a set batter. 
And over the course of that innings, his lengths start to completely change. Put it this way, in the first innings, Wagner bowled three bounces. In the second, he bowled 18 and took two wickets with him. That's the end of his fourth phase. Now, I don't need to tell you what happened next because chances are you have seen Wagner bowl or my video on him. But he does become the most unique test seamer since Bob Appleyard. So if you take the India series as a halfway point and you look at his lengths before and after, you will see that how remarkable this change is. He bowls so many short balls that he currently has the most wickets of any bowler in history, according to Hawkeye, of pitching the ball nine meters or shorter. Second and third are Stuart Broad, who is a foot taller than him and probably a yard faster as well, and Mitchell Johnson, who is three yards quicker and was known to destroy people with the short ball. So that just tells you how many wickets he's got with the short ball. And so does this from Crickfield. No one has ever taken a higher percentage of wickets bowling as many balls short of a length or further back than Wagner has. And this even includes the period when he was bowling fuller. And when you look at this list of names, he is by far the shortest and slowest of all of them. And of course, this is the phase that he is now known for. But it is interesting that it took him so many different changes to get to this point in his career. But I just want to talk about how successful he was with this new move. From the end of that Indian series to the end of 2019, he took the sixth most wickets in Test cricket. And let's focus on number four and number seven on this list. That's the two guys from the Titans that kept him out of South African and even domestic contention. They both bowled exactly as people always thought they would. Stain was skillful at a very fast pace, and Mornay bowled fast, back of a length, and tall. Neil Wagner invented a new kind of bowling, fast, medium, left arm bounces with a stacked new wave body line kind of feel. And here he is with some of the best bowlers of his, or any generation. And they were all here because they did exactly what they were designed for. Wagner was on his fourth reincarnation, just trying to force a career by any means necessary. The other thing to note is that when he came up with this method, it was a dark day for seam bowlers. The batters were in total control, and so an extreme method like Wagner had to be found. And while the rest of the world's bowlers just hope for a nice pitch on occasion, Wagner invented a whole new length. He was more than happy not to bowl with a new ball, and would bowl really long spells when nothing was going on with the wicket at all. He became the king of getting out set batters. And you can see by 2015, he was so happy with his method that he bowled an average of nearly nine meters. That's very short. But by 2019, it was clear that cricket had changed a little bit. The wobble ball had come in, the kookaburra had been upgraded, and seamers were well on top. So that was the end of phase four. It just made no sense banging the ball into the middle of the wickets when everyone else was nipping it around. Teams wanted to keep the ball as fresh as you could for as long as possible to maintain some lateral movement. Also, Wagner got old. There is a big difference bowling his filthy armpit balls at 135 kilometers an hour compared to 125. And while he still had some pace, he certainly couldn't bowl as quick as he had for as long as he had before, which had been a huge hallmark of his career. He was now getting into his mid and late 30s. So what did he do? He did what he always does. He just reinvented himself again. This is from Crickviz, and it shows you how comfortably above 130 kilometers he was until 2020. That year, his average speed is bang on it, and it's the same the following year, and then it drops to the mid to high 120s afterwards. But what Crickviz also shows is he starts to swing the ball more. Again, you can see by 2020, there is a big jump in how much he gets the ball to hoop around. We saw this with the ball that he bowled Zach Crawley with in the last test that happened to be a no ball. Wagner is swinging the ball so much more now. Partly because he's bowling slower, partly because he is bowling fuller, but mostly because he has to. But of course, against England, he still bowled short when he thought that was the right option. Meaning for the first time in his career, he is actually probably a complete bowler. That is what professionals do. They continue to improve. They keep adding things to keep themselves relevant. And there is no doubt that Phase 5 is the last time we will see Wagner in Test Cricket. And he's holding on now because he has a little bit of everything in his game. And he may not last that longer. But just remember what he had to do to get here in the first place. Phase one, he was stuck behind greats. Phase two, he was accurate, left arm and high energy and little else. Phase three, he was too slow, but trying very hard. Phase four, bounces. Phase five, whatever will work for him. There are many things to like about Neil Wagner, but the fact that he never stopped changing, trying, improving, just because he couldn't see another way is such a great part of his story. Neil Wagner told people he would do whatever he had to to make it as professional. And at the age of nearly 37, he is still running in. And in this last match, he took his 250th wicket. The one thing that Neil Wagner always wanted to do the most was just get the most out of himself as a cricketer. Well, that job is more than done.